I adore her voice. She has a, a, a very unique voice. She had a career like this, you know, straight. Straight, but not straight like this, straight like this. <laughs> Muscuri is one of the biggest selling female artists of all time. In a 50 year career, she sold over 350 million records and sang in over 15 languages. She's been a favorite of presidents, royalty, fellow performers, and loyal fans for the world over. I never dared to reach for the I don't know, I get a feeling of peace and happiness when I hear her music. I've been to see Nana Muscuri six times. I think she's absolutely wonderful. She always looked so elegant. Her dresses were always so elegant on her and the hair and there was a simplicity about her. Round and round with the special sound that you hear wherever you want I just thought she was absolutely magical. She did it so effortlessly. The music and entertainment industry has showered her with awards and honors and she has performed on all the world's great stages. At the end of a farewell world tour, she returned home to her native city of Athens in July 2008 to perform two last concerts in the ancient Herod Atticus Theatre at the foot of the Acropolis. She took her final bows in front of fans, family, friends, the Greek Prime Minister and dignitaries from capitals across Europe. My biggest doubts they are when I go on stage, but after a few songs, with the audience there, I have a total freedom. I can be myself because I trust that the audience, they trust me. And this confidence the audience gives me on stage, sometimes I don't have it in my life. This is where I started to sing, where everything started. And especially this place we are here, it's even more, uh, you know, it's my beginning. Ioana Muscuri, known to the world as Nana, was born in Hania the capital of the Greek island of Crete, on October the 13th, 1934. Her father, Kostas, was a film projectionist, and her mother, Aliki, a cinema usherette. In 1937, they moved with Nana and her older sister, Jenny, to Athens, where her father had found a job in an open-air cinema. The road that took her from there to international superstardom reads like a script from a Hollywood movie. A bespectacled, plump, shy child grows into one of the world's most iconic female artists. I lived on a dream all my life. It's a dream that I did not expect it also. It, it came to me like, a, like if I followed uh, the yellow brick road. From an early age, Nana and Jenny spent hours at the side of the stage where their father worked, dreaming they were the heroines of their favorite films. And when the films weren't showing, the girls took center stage. With my sister, it used to be our place to go up there on the stage and sing together the songs that my mother used to teach us to sing, and it was really wonderful. But the wonder of Nana's early childhood came to an abrupt end when the Second World War came to Greece. An initial invasion by the Italians was repelled by Greek and British troops with the fall of Athens to the Germans in May 1941. Greece became an occupied country. So the shadows moving and the terrible noise. I remember somebody throwing a grenade and killing people in the middle of the square. Uh, you know, things that, that, that really I don't like to, to, to remember. The toll paid by civilians was a heavy one. 
Over 300,000 died from starvation and thousands more were slaughtered for acts of defiance. Nana's father, like many Greeks, fought in the resistance. But tragically for Greece, liberation didn't stop the fighting. A bitter civil war had broken out between right and left-wing factions, wanting to fill the vacuum left by the occupying forces. The memory of this conflict left a lifelong imprint on Nana. What is war? This was the very first question I ever remember I asked. My, my father said it's when people don't like each other. And I thought later on that maybe there was a war in the house as well. Nana's father gambled. This caused financial insecurity for the family and led to problems between him and his wife. Mother had a beautiful voice and she was singing. She was playing also a little bit the mandolin and her dream was to be a singer. She was somehow a sad woman, like something did not happen to her in life. So the singing for her was also something to forget, to, to escape. And Nana found that when she sang, she too could escape from her cares and worries. I remember when, when there were troubles at home. I used to go to school and uh, I was looking the eyes of everybody and I wanted to know whether they realized that I was sad. I used to sing for the girls and when I was singing, you know, everybody was happy and I was happy as well. In fact, I was very, very, very shy and, and introverted. And sometimes I think that I became a singer just because, because I wanted to communicate. Light up your face with gladness. Hide every trace of sadness. When I was singing, I was, uh, you know, on a cloud. Uh, I was feeling light as a bird, and, and, and uh, things were better for me. I believe that uh, you communicate, in the case of Nana, with people in a very natural way. You can do exercises, you can discipline, you can have better techniques, but that communication is has to be natural. The voice is coming out and it's pure and it's gorgeous, and it touches you when you listen to it, and I think that's a, a, a big yeah. part of what made her successful. Both Nana and her sister Jenny had such beautiful voices. People told their parents they should send them to the prestigious Athens Music Conservatoire to train professionally. And for that, we decided to send us to two. We went to two together. We studied classical music at the beginning. Nana had a different voice in her voice. I was from what they called soprano. Nana πήγαινε μέτρο περισσότερο, γιατί είχε, βέβαια πολύ αργότερα μάθαμε ότι είχε κάποιο μικρό πρόβλημα στη χορδή της και αυτό έδειγνε την ιδιαιτερότητα αυτή που είχε. Both girls studied hard and the professor was impressed with their abilities. But after a year, there was some disappointing news. The, the problem was my father, who would spend everything. So, that, so they they had to 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 tell to the professor that that uh, that we couldn't go on. The teacher didn't want to lose either of the girls, but the school couldn't afford to keep both of them on without fees. Jenny knew how much singing meant to her sister, so she said she would be the one to leave. The pathos of the song of Nana was much bigger than the song of mine. That's the reason. I liked the song, but Nana was very familiar with the song of Nana. She thought that I would be very unhappy if I didn't sing. And so she went. And for years, I felt really guilty having stopped her from a dream. With Nana's dream of becoming a classical singer still alive, she applied herself to her studies. And to help out with family finances, 
she started singing in the Athens bars and nightclubs. Τότε λοιπόν εδώ υπήρχε άνθηση τον μπουάτ που δουλεύαμε όλοι και η Νάνα ήταν από τις πλέον περιζήτητες. Στο Ρέξ λοιπόν που τραγουδούσε η Νάνα ήταν, εγώ ήμουν από κάτω και πολλές φορές με κοίταγε να δει αν της κάνω νόημα αν τραγουδάει καλά ή όχι και η Νάνα τραγουδούσε απάνω με πολύ μεγάλη επιτυχία. But money wasn't the only reason Nana was singing in the clubs. I was having fun when I was singing in the nightclubs. I was very fond of jazz, and I was very fond of uh, popular Greek music, of course. I think the training that I had in the nightclubs, uh, singing all sorts of music, it was something uh, that helped me in the future. Nana loved classical music, but like other Sered, she also loved the new sound of popular music. By now, Nana had a new music professor, and he didn't approve of her singing in the clubs. He banned her from taking her exams, and Nana felt she had no choice but to leave the conservatoire, which she did with a heavy heart. For years, I, I had a very big complex of it. I think even now, when I hear uh, classical music, I start by having a sad feeling in me. And then it, then it, it goes after a while. Classical is, you sing this here, and you sing this here, the same, and this here. You sing one opera in Italian, one in German, one in French, one in English, well, you know what I mean? She has been much more inventive in what she has done outside of the classic with a classical quality of voice. With a classical singing career now unlikely, Nana threw herself into popular music. Then, with the arrival of a big ship, came a big opportunity for Nana. When the USS Forrestal stopped off in the port of Athens in May 1959, entertainment was put on for the 5,000 strong crew. Nana was a last minute standing, but when the event organizer first saw her, he was less than impressed. When I arrived, the big problem was that, that the impresario was completely disappointed from my looks because I was a big girl with my glasses. And, and I kept saying, you know, is it more important to look nice and not to sing well? I said, I don't look very nice, but I do sing. While a lot of girls her age would have been crushed by this, Nana drew on the strength of character that would serve her so well throughout her career. No one was going to stop her singing because of how she looked. I remember I started with P Pete Kelly's blues. There's a sad thing, there's a bad thing, the blues. And by the time the whole orchestra started to play, I heard uh, four or 5,000 screams and how do you call it, little hats, white hats they wear, the sailors, they just whistles and then they throw everything. The report in the ship's newspaper, the 59er, recorded the event as follows. The crew was pleased to have Athens artists perform aboard ship. The fine performances by selected entertainers held the crew spellbound. Miss Nana Muscori, a ballad and blues singer, received a number of encores from the men and remained in the spotlight of the stage for about 20 minutes. It was a triumph. It was a triumph. <laughs> I mean, the next day, everybody was talking the success that I had on that boat. The highly respected composer Manos Hagitakis had also heard the talk about Nana. His music, combined with the lyrics of the poet Nicholas Skatsos, had a profound influence on Nana's musical development and career. Paper Moon, one of their first songs Nana recorded, enraptured Greek audiences. And a voice so inspired Hagidakis 
and Gatsos that they were soon writing songs especially for her. When these two people came first into my life, first of all, they gave me songs that they were not like anything else. And they gave me also an identity as a Greek singer. They would draw every sensitivity from everything I had inside of me with their music. My Love is Somewhere was a Hajidakis and Gatsos song written for her that Nana performed as a brief cameo in a 1960 film, Rendezvous in Corfu. When Konstantinos Karamanlis, the Greek prime minister, first heard Nana sing it, he said he'd never been so moved by a song. The song was a special one for Nana because it brought her the first of the many prizes and awards of her career. In 1959, she performed it at the King George Hotel in Athens at the first festival of Greek song where it took first prize. It was the hit song from another 1960 Greek film that brought Greek music and by association Nana's voice to the attention of a world audience. Never on a Sunday, was a Pygmalion tale of an American tourist trying to reform an Athens port prostitute. The leads were played by Jules Dassin and Melina Mercury. The film was nominated for five Academy Awards, taking the Oscar for Best Original Song for its theme tune, The Children of Piraeus, by Nana's mentor, Manos Hachidakis. Overnight, the film sparked a huge interest in Greek music and culture. Τότε όλοι οι Έλληνες νιώσαμε όπως όταν κερδίσαμε πριν δύο-τρία χρόνια το Champions League, το ευρωπαϊκό προτάσμα στο ποδόσφαιρο. Είχαμε βγει στο δρόμο και φωνάζαμε και τραγουδάγαμε βέβαια το ποτέ τη Κυριακή. Manas had wanted Nana to record the song for the film, but Melina Mikuri, a singer as well as an actress, refused to lip sync to anyone. But when the song was released as a record, Manas insisted Nana was the one to sing it. People started to, to listen to Greek music because of Hachidakis, of course. And I was lucky because I was a singer singing for, for, for that. That was really a big chance for me. For Greece, I became the voice. You know, the voice, the new voice that it is between classical and jazz and pop. When Louis Hazan, a leading French record producer, heard it, he dropped everything to go and hear Nana sing at the second Festival of Greek Song in May 1960. He later recalled the experience. A young woman came on squeezed into a tight black dress, her hair pulled straight back, wearing no makeup and with glasses on her nose and overweight by as much as 70 pounds. That could not be her. I was crushed. Then, standing absolutely still, eyes closed, hands clasped behind her back, she began to sing in that incomparable voice. Then I recognized her and I swore to myself, I would make her famous throughout the world. Hazan was a hugely influential figure in Nana's recording career. He signed her to Fontana Records, and straight away began looking for ways to promote the label's new talent. An opportunity came when Hajidakis was asked to compose five songs for the soundtrack of a German documentary 
Greece, land of dreams. This presented Nana with a new challenge. They asked me if I could sing in German. I said, I don't speak German, but uh, I can try. I was attracted by the opportunity. And I say, yes, why not? Nana, το ένα μεγάλο προσόν τη ήταν η ίδια τη συμφωνή. Το δεύτερο μεγάλο προσόν ήταν ότι πάρα πολύ γρήγορα μπόρεσε να τραγουδήσει σε πολλέ γλώσσε. While Nana did seem to have a natural talent with languages, she also spent hours going over and over the songs in the studio. This drive for perfection had started at school. Πολύ επιμελής, το κάθε τι ήθελε να είναι τέλειο, ε, ε, ήταν καλή μαθήτρια, διάβαζε πάντα και νομίζω ότι αυτά τα χαρακτηριστικά της ε, ήταν αυτά που την έφεραν εδώ που είναι. Nana's application paid off. The Germans loved Weisser Rosen aus Athen. And the record sold over a million on its release. It gave Nana her first gold disc and went on to become her signature tune. And, and the funny thing is that they wanted to do it in every language afterwards because it succeeded in Germany. But I never thought it would go that far and roses became the symbol of my life. In December 1960, the flowers in Nana's life were her wedding bouquet when she married her musician boyfriend, George Petzilis. But the newlyweds had little time to settle into married life. Nana's international career was taking off. The next 18 months were a whirlwind. She recorded her first songs in France, went on her first tour to Germany, and in 1962, was invited to record an album with Quincy Jones in New York. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in Why it's almost like being in love I used to see so many films about New York, the music, uh, the showbiz. But of course it was fascinating for me everything, to see it real. Even more it was because it was Quincy, that I was going with Quincy in America. Quincy Jones, the artistic director at Mercury Records, was one of America's hottest young music producers. Nana's record company in France had sent him a tape of Nana singing jazz covers, and he immediately expressed an interest in doing an album with her. As always, Nana couldn't wait to get started. I was asking him every day, so what, what do we do today? What do we do today? When do we go to the studio? When do and he would say, no, take it easy. You, know, you are the big couple to have fun. And for three weeks, we were going to see all the clubs from the smallest to the biggest one, to hear all the singers that I could possibly hear. You know, Diana Washington, Nancy Wilson, so of course, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, all of the singers of the time. It was really something that always inspired me. They said, Someday you'll find all who love are blind. When your heart's on fire, you must realize smoke gets in your eyes. The end results pleased everyone. The girl from Greece had sung and left a good impression on her first outing to the States. It wouldn't be too long before she was back, but the next opportunity was waiting for her in Paris. Louis Hazan had got her a supporting slot at the prestigious Olympia, Paris's oldest music hall. Her initial reaction to the news surprised him. On a previous visit to Paris, she had heard the legendary Edith Piaf sing there. Of course, I was horrified with the idea. I said, I will never go back because on stage anymore because I have no right to call myself a singer when you have seen 
Miss Piaf on stage. It was the first time Nana's confidence in her singing had faltered, and she even started worrying that as a performer, her appearance might be important. It was Hazan's wife, Adil, who reassured her about her singing, but also encouraged her to think a little more about how she looked. The French had been taken with Nana's singing from the outset, but she hadn't really set the fashion world alight. But before any sort of transformation could take place, Nana had to face up to some deep-rooted issues from her childhood. My father, from the beginning, he wanted to have a boy, so I grew up with this. This was one of my complexes. I did not trust myself. I didn't like myself because my father didn't like the idea I was a girl. So I, I was trying not to be a girl and look like a boy. With her appearance at the Olympia Theatre looming in the December of 1962, Nana decided it was time to do something about her weight. Odile arranged for her to see the doctor who had helped opera singer Maria Callas. Nana agreed an eating plan with him. He told her to come back in three weeks, but only if she'd lost five kilos. So I left and I came back three weeks and I lost ten. Nana's performance at the Olympia supporting Georges Brassard went down well, and five years later, she was back there as the headline act with the whole country calling her Little Darling Nana. On en arrive à un paradoxe, Anna Mouskouri, c'est que vous êtes plus connue dans le monde entier qu'en France, peut-être. C'est votre avis? Non, pas, pas actuellement. As Nana's popularity grew in France, she had the opportunity to work with some of the country's leading artists, the likes of Michel Legrand and Charles Aznavour. I noticed the beautiful voice she had and the, and the beautiful delivery. She's uh, very quietly at that moment where we had in France the Ye Ye, which was not quiet, you know what I mean? Over the years, they sang together on many occasions, but the song for which they became best known was the emotional ballad about the pleasure and the pain of love. trip to Britain for the 1963 Eurovision Song Contest that took Nana a step further on her path to superstardom. On behalf of the BBC, welcome to the eighth annual Eurovision Song Contest. The last of our guests from the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg... As Greece didn't have an entry that year, Luxembourg asked Nana to sing for them. so sure I will not win. And I think the first time that I did television in my life without having an audience, and it was very strange for me, you know, it was technically all, also was not, not used to it, and I, I think I didn't perform right. Nana came eighth in the contest, but something about her impressed the program's director. And it was the start of a long working relationship and friendship. I just liked the voice and I thought it was, I thought she had a personality. Um, I suppose it was unusual to see a singer uh, wearing glasses. She didn't look like everybody else. She didn't have blonde hair and she, she was very distinctive in her appearance. I think it was a bonus in the end. It was not a disadvantage. I don't think the eyeglasses did very much. 
to enhance her performance. I think her power as an artist and the fact that she prevailed made the glasses acceptable. The glasses had been a bone of contention between Harry Belafonte and Nana when she toured America and Canada with him in 1964. She had such a beautiful face, and when she was out of the glasses, she didn't have this, this facade behind which she could hide. And I thought by taking off the eyeglasses, more about her would be revealed, but she became deeply uncomfortable. I sang for two nights without my glasses. And the third night I went to say, Mr. Belafonte, I cannot continue without my glasses. I said, if you want me to stay, let me sing with my glasses, and then, uh, if not, then I, I have to go, I'm sorry. As with so many other of Nana's admirers, what mattered most to Harry was the voice which had entranced him the first time he'd heard it in an Athens nightclub. Well, when you read classic literature, you always hear about the voice that sounds like a nightingale. And it always sounded kind of very quaint and wonderful and terribly ancient. But, you know, who sings like a nightingale? Until I heard Nana. Nana was equally in awe of Harry, and especially admire his confidence in stagecraft, things that didn't come naturally to her. When I saw her, the only thing she did at all in terms of stage movement was to move her hair to the side. She had a constant habit of doing like that. At the beginning, I used to keep my hands in the back because I didn't know what to do with the hands, and uh, I closed my eyes. Watching him working, it was a great thing for me, how he was treating the audience, how he was performing, how he was rehearsing, the precision of certain things. He had to organize everything. She was always very shy, but eventually she became so comfortable with the musicians, with the material, with the audiences, that uh, she soon became quite, she began to grab the edge of her dress and give a little flurry to it. Since directing Nana on Eurovision, Yvonne Littlewood had invited her to do a single show on a BBC folk series. Viewers responded so enthusiastically that Yvonne was sure the young Greek artist could carry a series of her own. The idea was put to David Attenborough, who was the BBC Two controller, and he gave it the green light. The series was an instant hit and ran for eight years. You know, we should remember that in those days we didn't have all the holiday programmes, so Greek music and, and anything Greek wasn't as well known to the average public as, as it is now. From the very outset, people got caught up in the colour of it all. The opening images of Greece, the songs, the sets, the costumes, but most of all, Nana's own special style. Good evening, or Kalispera, as we would say in Greek. Sitting at the edge of the beach, 
I wish that the mountains were lower than they are, so I could see my true love's island. I wish the boats were little glasses filled with wine, so I could drink to love with all your friends and mine. She would give the gist of the subject of the song before she sang it. And uh, that was really quite unique and quite charming. One guest in each, Donovan, John Williams, Jacques Roussier, Trier. We brought people from Greece. There, there was Marinella, a very good singer, Demis Russo. I can say what I want, say what I need. The list just went on and on. Stomp your feet and shake your tambourine. And lift your voices to the sky. God loves you when you sing. Oh, what kind of things do the king singers sing? The king's singers were an up and coming a cappella group who often performed on the show with Nana. And it was like entering a completely new world, the wonderful world of light entertainment such as they used to be on television in those good old days. And um, it was just the most wonderful experience to be sharing a platform with some of the great stars of the time. Nana's husband George also played alongside her with his group, the Athenians. Nana's show became one of the earliest platforms for a variety of world music and there was a world audience for it. Soon, a BBC shows were being sold to countries around the world and Nana's fame was spreading. I suppose in the 70s she was already a huge television star, but there weren't that many around in those days. It didn't seem to affect her at all. She just seemed, oh, terrible cliché, she just seemed like the girl next door having a great time. I think that was partly what made the series so enjoyable for everybody watching. I never thought I'd know heaven so soon. As well as enjoying her career, Nana was also enjoying family life. She and George had the first child, Nicholas, in 1968, and two years later their daughter, Helene, came along. I think that my life uh, was wonderful, but if I didn't have my children, it wouldn't be the same. When they were very young and we had to go a long trip, you know, they would come with us. It was much easier. The problem started really uh, when we, they went to school. There they had to stay at home, you know, because they had to have a steady life. All my tomorrows I give to you over and over. The family set up home in Geneva. The children had a full-time nanny to look after them while Nana and George were touring. I remember her singing all my life, yeah. I don't remember her not being on tour or anything. It's like part of her character, basically. So it's just always been like that. Nana found it difficult being away from the children, but she feared without her music she would have struggled. I had so many fears in my life and uh, and uh, anguish and, and worries, and, and I, I was not a very stable person, always. Stage gave me this balance, and my music gave me the balance to trust myself and, and stay on the right track. 
we'd prefer to see her on stage, you know, doing her career and traveling around the world and being totally fulfilled and happy, rather than forcing herself to stay at home and be uh, a... At home and sad. Yeah, because she would have just... She was not the home mom type, was she? Yeah. Not at all. By the early 70s, Nana had become a global star as country after country succumbed to her charms. She became enormous in France, in Germany, in England, in America, in Canada, in Japan, and everywhere, you know. In 1969, Nana was invited to perform at the Royal Albert Hall for the first time, and she returned there in 1974 to do a televised special with her husband's group, the Athenians. <laughs> and of course, you know I'm Nana, but perhaps you don't know that I am also Mrs. George. <laughs> You lucky girl. <laughs> However famous Nana got, she never minded some fun at her own expense. Thank you so much. Would you? What, what is you. it? Thank you. What is it? It's a Greek urn. <laughs> hey, go on, go on, say it. What's a Greek urn? <laughs> About five quid a week. <laughs> Be honest. Be honest. Nerves, That's a Greek This is a little yeah. <laughs> By 1975, Nana had sold so many records that a company presented her with a wall of 100 gold and platinum discs. Days of devils, kings and clowns, angel songs and birthday tunes. But what should have been one of the happiest times in her life was also one of the saddest. Although everything appeared fine on stage, the strains of married life on the road and in the spotlight had become too much for Nana and George, and they divorced. I think in my life, of course, I do a lot of mistakes, but I think my big failure in front of my children is the divorce. But I learned also that it is better to divorce than staying and fighting. I think my children would have been more unhappy if they would see us to fight between us, like I have seen my mother and my father do. She did her best, like summer, would spend a month with my father and then the rest of the summer with, with her. Um, so she tried really her best to give us as normal a life as possible. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and That's I think funny. we're okay. Yeah, we're not that bad. Yeah. <laughs> not that traumatized, are we? <laughs> Nana's cover version of Neil Sedaka's Our Last Song Together was a track on one of the first albums Nana recorded after a split from George, Love Goes On. And it did for Nana through her music. This will be songs I, I, I found love. You have to be in love in, in the words you know that you say and the person to whom you are sing to. You discover Nana when you sing with her much more than a singer, an incredible woman. Nana is very vulnerable. She is that class of person that has a vulnerability inside. And that is very attractive because it means there is something who moves inside deeply. Nana's next global hit in 1981 was a surprise departure for the Queen of the Romantic Ballad. 
Reversioned in French for Nana, the chorus of the Hebrew slaves from Verdi's Nabucco became the freedom anthem, Je chante avec toi, liberté. The record was the idea of André Chappelle, Nana's music producer, who had by now become her new partner. The record went triple platinum in weeks, and Nana was even given the rank of a French army officer to sing it for the Bastille Day celebrations at the Berlin Wall in 1982. When Nana sang of liberty, she sang from the heart. Ever since the Greek Civil War ended in 1949, the country had been destabilized with power struggles between the left and the right. In 1967, there was a military coup, and King Constantine II and Prime Minister Karamanlis went into exile. Many artists spoke out against the oppressive ruling colonels, and the Never on a Sunday actress Melina Mercuri was at the front of the campaign. Having set up home in Geneva, Nana looked on horrified at what was happening in her homeland. When the Hunda came in, I was out and we didn't go back for this period, and we were trying to help as we could from outside. But I, I was not ready to pick up the voice and speak about those problems because I was not educated for that. I was not a political person and I was always afraid to make a big mistake instead of helping just to do wrong. If Nana felt that she had not spoken out enough for a country, a country did not share the view. Democracy was restored in Greece in 1974 and in 1980, the former prime minister, Karamanlis, was elected as president of the Hellenic Republic. At a concert he hosted with Melina Mercuri in the Herod Atticus Theatre to celebrate the Republic's 10th anniversary, it was Nana he asked to perform. It was one of the most emotional moments of her life and the first time she'd performed in her country for 20 years. But whatever Nana's appeal for the great and good, it's been her popular appeal for millions of ordinary people around the world that has kept her songs permanently in the music charts. Biggest climber up 17 at eight, only love from Nana Muscuri. Only Love was the theme tune of a 1984 blockbuster drama, Mistral's Daughter. It was an international co-production and the producers wanted someone who could appeal in all the languages in which it was being produced. Nana was the obvious candidate, and when the song was released, it became another massive hit for her, nearly 30 years into her career. And how you gave that love to me. People can sustain a long artist life like Nana's has if you don't have an incredible discipline. Because you cannot handle to be on a stage for so many years and without the discipline.
Over the years, Nana's enduring popularity had often led to requests to perform in benefits for humanitarian causes. Then, in 1993, she was formally asked to be a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF, highlighting the plight of underprivileged children around the world. Our mother is somebody who, when she wants to do something and help someone, she will just up and do it. She wants to give a little bit of what she's had to others to help them out. Yeah, that's part of her whole generosity. Yeah. Like she's generous on stage and she's generous in life for others. And also because she comes from a very poor background. She yeah. knows what it's like yeah. to have nothing. Nana's work for UNICEF was increasingly politicizing her. But it was still an incredible shock when she was asked by Miltus Evert, the Greek Attorney General, to stand as a member of the European Parliament in 1994. He told me, you are going to help your country. I mean, I, and I thought I would. I mean, I didn't want to go, but he said, you have to. It's your responsibility, it's your country. I thought I would be a bridge between Greece and the European community. The sentiments were noble, but that didn't make the reality of such a sudden career change terrifying. I knew nothing how it works there too. You know, I didn't go to the university. I don't know how to make a report. I was a curiosity, yes, because to say what does she come to do here? I mean, she was well, she's, she's not going to. Uh, uh, she only knows to sing. But Nana was determined to do the best job she could, even if it came at the cost of her passion for performing. I think credibility could have been a problem for her, but. She overcame that because she was extremely hardworking. She took her role very, very seriously. And the respect, I think, that people held her in as a result of that was, was immense. I think there was enough goodness in Nana to serve human need. But I don't think the arena of politics, she was ruthless enough and tough enough to be a part of that environment. That's a tough business. So I called her and we spoke a little bit about it, but she convinced me that uh, she would know when it was not working and get out before it was too late, if it came to that. After a first five-year term in office, Nana decided to stand down. One issue had become critical for her, and it was conflict, the horror of which had haunted her from childhood. I think after the war in Kosovo and everything, I wouldn't stay in the parliament. I mean, I, I couldn't, because the European community is done, is made to prevent the war between the countries. So to let the war in our region, it, it was wrong. This is what disappoints me, and I see that it still goes on the same way. We need politicians, of course, because we need uh, leaders. Artists, they just only help people dream and hope. The dreams and hopes Nana has given to her fans over a 50-year career has been rewarded with a tremendous loyalty from them. It was this loyalty that prompted her to return to scene and do a final world tour after leaving the European Parliament. Fans with Nana are, are, are quite amazing. She's very respectful to them, and maybe once a year she holds a little party and, you know, they, they come and they talk and she talks to them, and the amazing thing is they follow her all around the world. Nana, she's great for that. She stays two hours after and signs the autograph, and she talks with the people nicely. Uh, it's tiring. I go home immediately after the show. I hate autographs. She, she's done that very gently. It's beautiful. Thank you for the joy you keep me in my life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was the point when I said, what if something very bad happens, an accident, and I will never be able 
to say thank you to the audience and thank you uh, and goodbye whatever happens in the future. At the age of 69, when most people are already in retirement, Nana began a farewell tour that took in four continents over four years. But whatever the country, and whatever the language, the reception was always the same. Happy little bloomers fly Be In July 2008, Nana Muscuri returned to Athens and was honored with the freedom of the city where her extraordinary journey had begun. For the shy little girl who had conquered the world, the only place for her final two concerts was home. Everywhere has been so wonderful, but these two concerts were maybe the, the toughest one because uh, I know these are the, the last ones. Megali Perifania. Megali Perifania. Και δεν έχω μετανιώσει ποτέ. Χαίρομαι που τη βλέπω και καμαρώνω που τη βλέπω και υπερφανεύομαι και εγώ και όλοι στο σπίτι μας. Η κόρη μου προχθές το βράδυ έκλεγε και έλεγε ότι σήμερα είμαι πάρα πολύ υπερήφανη με τη θεία μου. And the people need her. She will not retire. No, no, I can see, I can see Nana singing in the next 40 years, 50 years. She'll sing again. <laughs> if it's the nana that I know, you're going to hear her chirping somewhere. In the barnyard, in the shower, but she would, it's not the last one. What do you think of our musical mix here on BBC4? Have your say on the BBC4 website. Stay with us now on BBC4 for more Nana Muscuri with a fresh compilation of all her visits to Auntie. Next. Good.